I told you um, in the children's message, I'm talking about Joseph today. And I'm talking about a journey from the pit to the palace. Uh, but before I get into that, I, I, I received some glowing remarks from my joke from last week. So I'm going to start us out with a joke again. And under the same theme and context, three guys, three friends die in a car crash. And they go to heaven. When they get to heaven, they're in orientation. And they're all asked the same question. What do you hope your family and friends say as they're gathered around your casket at your funeral? The first guy raises his hand. He says, well, I was a doctor. I hope they say I was a great doctor. I saved a lot of lives, and, and I did great things for my community. The second guy says, oh, 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 I was a teacher. I hope they say I was a great husband, a great dad, and, and, and I helped children across the, you know, the world to be better people. The third guy is over there, and he scratches his head, and he says, listen. I hope they say, look, he's moving. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. So, uh, we're at the story, um, the story about Joseph. The other night, um, I, I had uh, the opportunity to sit alongside my dad and watch a movie. It was called Seasons of Grey. It was actually the story of the modern life of Joseph. Basically, they took the story out of the Bible and they put it in today's times. Instead of horses, they would pick up trucks and stuff like that. Um, and, and I put the movie on, and I'm, we're about 15 minutes into the movie, and I pause it, right? And I look at my dad, and I'm like, Dad, I don't know if you realize this, but this is, this is about Joseph, right? And I'm expecting him to say, what are you talking about, right? But he says, oh, I know. And, and like, he just starts regurgitating Genesis 37 and beyond to me. Like, he's knowing names and dates, and I'm like, wow, I just read this the other day, and you're going deeper than me. But I thought it was amazing, because I was thinking about talking about Joseph, and that's somewhat solidified. We got to sit there and, and just share this scripture together and, and what it meant to each of us. And I think that's why Bible studies are so important. I think that's why reading the Bible with, with someone else is so important, because... It is the interpretation that you both have that you can share that really brings out God's word and what it means to you. But I'm going to tell you what the story of Joseph means to me today. And, and um, you know, uh, as you study the, the life of Joseph, it's amazing that 13 chapters in the book of Genesis is written about Joseph. The first 11 consists of 2,000 years and 13 consists of just Joseph. So he must have been a pretty, pretty powerful man in God's eyes. Joseph's story is one of great hope, great faith, redemption, and forgiveness. It starts with a dream and quickly goes to a lot of disappointment. And I know that most of us have all experienced some sort of crisis in our life at some point. Maybe it was persecution, being mistreated by others. Maybe you got a raw deal or you're living in a life's not so fair narrative. Life just keeps knocking you down every time you try to get your head above water. And I don't think you have to live in this world very long before someone hurts you. And in some cases, that someone's a complete stranger, but I hate to say it more often than not, it's the person that's closest to you. It could be a, a brother that abuses, a sister that steals, a mother that disappoints, a father that beats. It could be a child that neglects. And when you get into these moments, forgiving is so hard. And I think that's one thing that you know, we have to understand how important forgiveness is, and we're going to talk about that more today. I know I've walked through a lot of hardships and tough circumstances in my life. Not to say they're any more than what you've been through, but they're no fun. And, and you know, but I think there's one thing that so many of us miss as we walk through these times. And that is, if you have faith, you'll quickly discover that how real your relationship is with Jesus Christ. Your response to these trials reveal what's really inside of you. They reveal the depth of that relationship. And when we step into one of these narratives, we have choices. We can trust God in those circumstances God has put us in, or we can take control of it ourselves and crash and burn. We all have dreams. The reality is sometimes the pictures in our mind of those dreams don't exactly add up exactly the way we see it or think it. I think that we've all had moments where we've said, why me, God? Why? Why me? I know I do, and, and I think it's because we share this crazy illusion in life that somehow we're in control of it, and we're not. So even though things may be tough right now, 
Do you have the courage to trust God in your circumstance? Well, Joseph's story starts out with a dream. And somewhere between the, the, the dream's conception and the dream's fulfillment, there is a, a turbulent story that takes place. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Joseph was the son of Jacob. He was the grandson of Isaac. He was the great-grandson of Abraham. And he grew up in a dysfunctional family. There were 12 brothers in this family. He was one of them. He was 11 of 12. And in this family, his dad had four different wives that consisted amongst these 12 children. And to say they were dysfunctional was a, was a serious understatement. To get a sense of the family dynamics in Genesis 37, we start in verse 2. It talks about Joseph being a 17-year-old boy, just barely old enough to graduate high school. And here he is. He's the favorite of his dad, as you heard me tell the children. His dad loves him. He gives him the best jobs. He, he spoils him rotten. And his brothers resent this, especially his oldest one, Reuben, who's like, wait a minute, man, I'm, I'm the guy, right? I'm the oldest. Why not me? And they start to resent Joseph. But it takes even more legs when his dad one day decides him to give, this, give him this robe, this robe that they, you know, and again, if, if my dad gave me a robe, I'm not going to be doing cartwheels up and down the church. But at that point in time, I guess this robe was important. It was full of colors. And... This kind of said, listen, you're, you're the namesake, right? You're the next guy in charge. If something happens to me, you're the guy. And this made the brothers even angrier. They were so angry. It says they actually despised him. The Bible says they couldn't even speak a kind word to him. And I think Joseph didn't help matters. I think he kind of provoked the hostility. I mean, he was, he was somewhat of a tattletale. You know, he'd go and tell his dad all kinds of things like, Dad, you know, Judah did this again, or Dan did this again, or Reuben did this again. And that just escalated. But one day he had the audacity to take it to a different level. See, Joseph was known as a dreamer. And Joseph had these dreams. And he decides to pull all these brothers together. Remember, they don't like him. They don't want to be around him. They don't want to hear him talk. He says, now, oh, come on, I have this great dream I want to share with you. So they all gather around and like, yeah, okay, what now, almighty one? What now, little bro? And he says, last night I had this strange dream. He said, we were tying up bunches of grain out in the field when my bunch stood up and all of yours bowed down to me. I'm like, what? Look, whatever, man. He says, no, no, I had another dream that the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. He's basically saying, look, I'm going to rule and you're going to bow down to me. I'm, maybe I'm brainstorming here, but hey, here I am in the center of the universe. And they just despise him even more. They actually hate him. They say, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us? Do you think we'd ever bow down to you? Well, as the story goes on, that's where it takes the spin. They're miles away from the house, and Joseph sent to check on him. When he gets there, they see him coming from a distance. I don't think they saw his face, but I know they saw that robe coming. And they said, here he comes. Here comes that dreamer. It's funny when we're angry with somebody or we envy somebody or we're jealous of somebody. We don't call them by their name, right? Here comes that dreamer. I won't use any more examples inside the church, but sometimes we tend to use different nouns to discuss people. But anyway, here comes that dreamer, right? So Joseph comes and, and he gets there and they just start beating him up. They rip the robe off him. And as you heard my assistant earlier, they put some blood on him. But they, they rip the robe off and they throw him in a pit. And they throw him in a pit to die, but then they start to have a conscience. Reuben especially says, yeah, I don't think we can kill him. So they see some slave traders in the area and they say, hey, we can make some money on this deal. You can have him, just take him as far away as you can. And these slave traders take Joseph and they, of course, as you heard me tell the children, they, they, uh, they put blood on the robe, they take the robe back to the dad and they say, hey, listen, I, Dad, I think a ferocious animal uh, ate Joseph, but we got his robe. You want it back? You know. Um, anyway, you, you can only imagine the grief that the dad had. So, as the story goes on, the 17-year-old boy is now being taken to a different country. He's taken to Egypt. He's taken to Egypt as a slave, and he's sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. He's an Egyptian official. He's actually in charge of all the bodyguards for Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the land. He's in charge of the bodyguards. He's the executioner, right? Well, as the story says it in 39.2, 
it says as, as uh, or 30, yeah, 39 2, the Lord was with Joseph. And in that moment, as Potiphar accepted him, he saw the godly presence inside of Joseph. He saw that and he put him in charge of, a, of his entire property, in charge of everything. He loved him that much. He thought he was that good of a God. So just as things are looking up for Joseph, just as things are starting to get better for Joseph, here comes Mrs. Potiphar. And Mrs. Potiphar, we can just assume she was an attractive lady, trophy wife, so to speak, for this large Egyptian official. And they say that Joseph was a handsome man. She starts hitting on him. And she wants, she wants Joseph bad. And Joseph says the most amazing thing in Genesis 39, 9. He says, how then could I do such a wicked thing to God? How then could I sin against God? I don't think it's a secret. Um, temptation and sexual sin in men is somewhat common. Here he has an opportunity, an opportunity to have one of the most powerful women, right, who's hitting on him. And what does he say? I'm not sinning against God. That's what he says in that moment. But this thing takes the desperate house wives turn that we expect. And she corners him one day. There's no servants around. There's no bodyguards around. The poor man is just trying to put on his coat and get out of there. And she corners him. She says, no, you're coming in the room with me. And he says, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. And they start wrestling around. And he finally get breaks free. Unfortunately, she's stuck with his coat in her hand. And he runs out the door. Humiliated, standing there with his coat. She tears her dress and starts screaming, rape, rape, rape. Well, as the servants and bodyguards come into the room, well, it's obvious what it looks like. Joseph accused of rape. Raping the executioner's wife and so on. And he casts him into prison. Here we go again. You know, I think it's, if you think about it, this guy's the leader of all the bodyguards. He kills people for a living. You know, he's, he's again, Pharaoh's right-hand man. But yet he doesn't kill the guy who raped his wife. So there's one of two reasons for that. Well, probably the main one is God is protecting him. But the other one is that believe that Potiphar believed Joseph. He knew he was a godly man, but he had to save face with his wife, so he followed suit and, and he threw him in jail. Well, now Joseph is in prison. He's got impeccable integrity and knows that the Lord is with him, but he's back in that pit again. You know, we hear about so many people make bad decisions. You see it on the news, and they end up in jail. But in this case, Joseph didn't do anything to deserve this. It wasn't his sin. It wasn't his disobedience, his rebellion, his unfaithfulness. But now he was stuck dealing with it. It was his, his thing he had to deal with. He was the victim of somebody else's sin, somebody else's bad decisions. He started out a dreamer on top of the world. Then he became a slave. And what's worse than a slave? A slave and a prisoner. And that's where he is now. So it begs the question, where is God in the midst of all this disappointment? I mean, Joseph didn't do anything to deserve this. And I think we can all relate to a degree in our own lives when we're put in these situations. I mean, things come in our life that we don't think we deserve. And we ask God, where are you in the midst of this disappointment? You're diagnosed with cancer. You lose your job. God, where are you in the midst of this disappointment? You lose a child. You lose a spouse. You lose a lot of money. God, where are you in the midst of this disappointment? Where are you in the midst of this devastation? Where is God when you're in the pit? Well, strangely enough, the next text says exactly the same thing it did when Joseph first became a slave. In Genesis 39, 21, 22, it says that the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, that warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in prison. There's no place God can't go. There's no moment God cannot be in. Sometimes our greatest fear, our greatest hurt, our greatest pain is the greatest presence. I'm wondering if you're in a hard place. Maybe you're in a hard place today. Maybe it's uh, what kind of pit are you in? Maybe it's uh, a relationship pit or a workplace pit or a health pit or maybe literally a money pit. It's causing you despair. One thing about Joseph, when he was at rock bottom, he knew one thing. What he learned is that in the moment that the last place he would look, God was there. Hear this. 
I love this saying, God may not move you to a new place, but he can put a new you in an old place. That's amazing news. And he can even make that old place look like a new place. But you got to know it. you got to believe it. you got to have faith in it. So as the scripture says, the prison word became fond of Joseph. Put him in charge of the whole place. The scripture says, um, you know, he was, he was made in favor of the prison warden. I mean, this guy is so remarkable and so amazing. His dad picked him over 12 other brothers. Potiphar loved him. Mrs. Potiphar loved him. Now the prison warden loves him. So in this moment, there's an assassination attempt. Because God's interacting once again. And there's an assassination attempt on Pharaoh, and they throw in jail the, the most powerful man in the world, the butler and his baker. The butler's known as the, the cupbearer. And they get in jail, and they start having strange dreams. Probably because they went from living a lap of luxury to being in a jail cell. That's neither here nor there. They start to have these strange dreams. And they ask Joseph to interpret them, and the cupbearer goes to Joseph and he shares that dream with him. And Joseph says, Mr. Cupbearer, in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head and restore you to your old position. And all he asks the cupbearer to do is to tell Pharaoh about him when he gets out. He doesn't want to be in there no more. And the cupbearer says, oh, are you kidding me, Joseph? I could never forget you. As soon as I get out, I promise I'll tell him all about you. Well, then the baker comes in, right? He says, all right, my turn. Let me tell you about my dream. He says, oh, Mr. Baker. Pharaoh, in three days, is going to take off your head and put your corpse on a bowl. And the banker's like, okay, Joseph, I will never bring another dream to you again. And needless to say, three days later, it didn't happen because the banker was executed and the butler, otherwise known as the cupbearer, was released just as Joseph had said it. But it wasn't Joseph's words that said it. It was God putting it on his heart. And Joseph made that clear to everybody. But what adds insult to injury in Genesis 40, 23 is, it says Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph. Never given him another thought. And, and, and that's, if that's not hard enough to believe, in chapter 41 it says he spent two more years after that moment in jail. Here he is, 30 years old, 13 years later after he was thrown into a pit by his brothers. Here he sits, once again, getting let down, getting disappointed. Sitting at rock bottom. But that was about to change. Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the land, has this dream and it's haunting him. And he starts just tearing apart the royal castle. He's like, somebody's got to tell me what this dream means. And that cupbearer who had that, you know, lots of memory has this epiphany. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Mr. Farrow. I remember this guy in jail. His name was Jack John. No, Joseph. He was able to read my dream and tell me exactly what it is. You ought to give him a shout. So Farrow brings Joseph into his quarters and he says, I understand you know how to interpret dreams. Joseph says, no. God tells me what they are. All I do is speak them to you. He says, well, here it is. Help me. Help me understand what's going on. Well, Joseph goes on to explain to him that over the next 14 years, there's going to be a, a time of prosperity followed by a, a time of famine. And if you do not prepare properly during that time of prosperity, you and your land will starve to death. So Pharaoh is just blown away by it. He says in Genesis 41, 38, he says, so Pharaoh asks his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Pharaoh says to Joseph, listen, since God has made this known to you, since you are such a wise man, you shall be in charge of my palace. And all of my people will submit to you. And only with respect to the throne am I greater than you. Translated Pharaoh saying, you're the second most powerful person in the world. Right now. Right now. I mean, you've got to understand one simple decree from this powerful dictator. Joseph goes from the pit to the palace. What just happened here? Here he was a prisoner, and now he's deputy pharaoh, vice president of Egypt, second most powerful man in the world. We need to learn from this. We need to learn just as God worked through Joseph in prison, he can work through us. When we find ourselves in that difficult moment, don't just pray, God, get me out of here, but ask God to reveal himself to you. Ask God to show you how he can use you in that situation. Joseph may have thought the cupbearer had forgotten all about him. But you know what? God didn't. It wasn't time yet. 
Just think, if, if the cupbearer got out and told Pharaoh all about him, maybe Pharaoh would have never thought of Joseph to bring his dreams to. It's in God's timing. And that's what we have to remember. I, I think that a lot of us, mainly me, probably worse than all of you, I'm an impatient person. I want it right now. But you know, there's this song that I love growing up by Garth Brooks that I think we all have to remember. Some of God's greatest gifts are all too often unanswered prayers. It's not that, you know, God's not listening. It's just not time. And we have to understand that. We have to respect that. So how does the story end? I think I ruined a little bit of it with the children. I'm going to talk about it anyway. Joseph's uh, wisdom saved many lives, not just in Egypt, but in nations around. This is where the plot thickens because the famine actually brings itself to the home to where Joseph had grown up, where his brothers and fathers still lived. So as they were facing starvation, they had to trek across to Egypt and beg for food. Little to their surprise, they never expected that they'd be on their hands and knees begging the very man that they threw in a pit. So here they sit, Joseph, knows who they are. They don't know who Joseph is. There's a lot to talk about in that moment, but I will just tell you this. He struggled a lot from that, Joseph did. He went through a lot of emotions. I mean, really and truly, who wouldn't want to say, get out of here. You're lucky I don't have you killed. But he didn't. But he struggled. He shed a lot of tears. And at the end of the day, this story comes full circle in Genesis 50, 19 through 21. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I am in a place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. But a man, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. I think we can all learn some lessons from Joseph's life. You must remember in your struggle, when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. When you're down to nothing, God's up to something. When you're in your pit experience, remember that pit is not your final destination. Because God is up to something. I will close with the forgiveness part of that story that I think too many human beings in this world struggle with. Which is why I refuse to watch the news anymore. There's too much crime out there. There's too much hate. There's too much discontent. I believe forgiveness keeps a, a, a barrier between us and God. I believe that when we refuse to forgive, that we cannot have that relationship that is so important with our Lord. Forgiveness, I'm sure you've heard, I've told so many people, it does not release that person nearly as much as it releases you when you finally let go of what's hurting you. When you refuse to forgive, you're stuck in a time machine. You're stuck in that moment. You're stuck in that moment. You just can't get away from it. And I think it's so important that we move on. I mean, this unresolved anger does nothing for us. For God is the judge. I, I watched a movie. Um, it, it was a great movie. It was about a, a, a father who lost a child. A young child was about the same age as my Maddie. And she was killed by a serial killer and taken away and, and potentially raped and, and, and murdered. And his father cannot forgive the person who did it. He can't let it go. And it consumes his life and his whole family, his, his other children, his wife, everybody's suffering because he's just in that funk. He's in that depression. See, that's what happens when we refuse to forgive. When we feel as though we've been treated unfairly, we resort to a bottle, we resort to a drug, we resort to a bed, we resort to a place we shouldn't be. And this father's just in turmoil. Well, God comes and has a meeting with him and he brings him to this lady called Wisdom. She's a beautiful lady. And when he's standing in front of Wisdom, she says, you've got to forgive that person. And he says, what are you kidding me? That person stripped away my life. That person took away my, my family. That person harmed an innocent little girl. How dare you ask me to forgive him? He should rot in hell. Why would God let this happen? This person was just as mad at God as he was at this serial killer. <clears throat> so Wisdom says, okay, got it. Here's your son, here's your daughter. And they're both standing there next to you side by side. She says, you know, your son, he's 16 years old. He's, he started cheating on tests. He's skipping school. He's been 
sneaking out of the house at night, and he's been lying to you. Here's your 18-year-old daughter. I'm not sure if you're aware, but she started smoking pot and drinking and hanging out with her friends. She's doing a lot of bad things. She's also lying to you. So do me a favor. Go ahead and pick one to go to heaven and one to go to hell. He says, whoa, 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 wait a minute now. I can't do that. I love them both. They're, they're, I know they're making mistakes and all, but they're good people. They're my children. I can't do that. Wisdom says, oh no, a minute ago you were the judge. A minute ago you thought you could do that kind of stuff. You thought you could be God. You thought you could pick. So go ahead and pick. He says, I can't. How about you just take me? Have you heard that story before? Just take me. And, and I think that's what's important. We have to let those things go. God is the judge. We are not the judge. Even if it impacts us, even if it's us that's affected, we are not the judge. God is in control. And even when we're in our pit, when we're at the very bottom, God is with us. And as long as we trust in Him, as long as we have faith in Him, He will take us to that palace. I promise you that. So we're going to close today um, with a song that I absolutely love. And I've closed with this song probably in 50 of the message that I've given, so it won't be a surprise to you. But I want to start with a scripture, Romans 12, 17 through 21. It says, don't hit back, discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I will take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, Go buy that person lunch. If he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. This song, this song, and, and Scott did such a good lead into the heart of our worship. This song, I've already told the story so many times up here, and I'm not going to do it again, but I am going to tell you that Horatio Spafford, who, a man who had his, all of his real estate, all of his money just swept away in a fire. A man that had his children lost at sea. Instead of going to the bottle, instead of going to the drug, instead of going to the bed, instead of going to the bar, he goes to the pen and he writes this magical song. It is well with my soul. Please stand for